Okay, good morning. Welcome, welcome. I'm really excited about today. I'm excited about today's message. We're going to be looking at this, this thing called the C4, um, and they're going to put the graphic up here on the screen for you, the C4 Guide to Building and Maintaining Relationships. And this means something very specific to me. Yeah, everyone in the back's going, Pastor, turn the TV on. I, listen, I got a lot going on, you know. There's other stuff going on in my mind right now. So the C4 approach to relationship management. This is really near and dear to my heart because relationships are a big deal. Relationships are a really important thing. And I've been on a bit of a vision journey, a vision quest, kind of a self-induced kind of odyssey as I've been thinking about relationships and, and this idea of actually having to try and like manage relationships. Now, for me personally... I'm not a huge fan of relationships, and I was really struggling with them. And so I went out and I found this C4 approach, which is kind of like a a curriculum. But I need you to really understand where I was coming from so that you can see why I found so much value in this. So remember, let me put relationships to you this way. I don't know if you've ever, I know some of you guys will admit to this and some of you will not, but I don't know if you've ever... Uh, chugged or, or drank a, a cool drink really fast or, or something like that, uh, something fizzy, sparkling water or beer or something, and then you have like a, a you take kind of air in with it, and then you burp. And, and everyone knows that like there's that time where you burp, but it's not all air. There's maybe just a little bit of wet behind it. And <laughs> listen, everyone farts, everyone burps. Let's just get that, let's just get that out of the way. But there's been this taste in my mouth when I think about relationships. It's kind of, I've got an emoji for it. I love to to use emojis. But when I think about relationships, this is kind of like the taste that I've had in the back of my mouth. And and one of the problems that I've discovered, and this is mostly a problem with with you guys, really, with other people, not so much me, is that, see, when it comes to relationships and dealing with each other, you guys see things your way, but I see things the right way. So, right? Now, if this were really true, if I could just get you guys to understand this, then our, our elders meetings and finance team meetings would be a whole lot faster. Um, I would get everything that I wanted at home, you know, my way, kind of done my way. But it's, it's so important here that it's like, how do I get you to see things the right way, or better yet, my way? And That's been a tough approach. That's been a tough thing for me to figure out. And that's really led me to my next question, which is this. What is wrong with everyone except for me? So the purpose of this series is I'm going to be teaching you guys some of the secrets that I've found. And so today's title is is Reassembly Required, How to Get People to See Things Your Way. So that's what we're going to learn today. And that's where this C4 approach to relationship management comes in. Now, I don't know how much more I need to sell this to you because this works. This is really, really a good thing. I've been applying it in my life over the last coming months, and and it's just made my, at least the way I deal with relationships, a lot easier. But the C4 approach is this. There's four C's. So the first one is we're going to convince, convict, coerce, and control. Now, this is how I'm dealing with people. It's how I'm dealing with all kinds of people in my life. I can convince them that I'm right and they're wrong. I can convict them that they're, they're wrong and they don't know what they're talking about. I can coerce them, which is like being passive aggressive, which I'm great at. And then control. You know, if I can just control the way you think or feel, then I, can, I, can, I don't have to even worry about the other three C's. Now, this works. And just in case you're having a a hard time accepting that maybe this would work, I've actually got a testimonial. This is proof that this works. It's it's actual documented proof. And so I'm going to play a testimonial video for you that you're going to watch, and then I'm going to come up and continue to unpack this. So turn your eyes to the screen. The C4 approach to relationship management has completely turned our marriage around. Absolutely. (laughs) So close to just failing, you know? (laughs) All four C's are complete game changers. Convince, coerce, convict, and control. (laughs) If there was a fifth C, it'd be cool. (laughs) Six months ago, I was going to take a week and a half off from my wedding and honeymoon. 
The day before I headed out to the resort, Lisa told me that she needed a pitch deck done in a day and a half. And what did I say? You said, looks like you'll need to postpone that wedding. <laughs> I'm single now. My relationship with my son has always been very interesting. He loves acting, but I love football. He's my son, he lives in my house, so he should be playing my favorite sport. The C4 approach to relationships understands that and helps me call all the right plays. I can't wait to try my costume. Uniform. And then go to my audition. Try out. Hey, what do you do when you score? You bow. Spike it, son. <laughs> you spike it. Hut, hut, hut. Check out the C4 approach to relationships ASAP. You'll learn things like how to shame journal. I started a shame journal myself, and it's just a detailed list of every time that Emily has hurt me or let me down. And now, when we have an argument, I just read her a few entries, and before you know it, she sees things my way. I've been journaling since eighth grade. Okay, so if that does not convince you that the C4 approach is the right approach to take, then I don't know what else will. I don't know how else to convince you of that. Now, what's interesting about this is I, I want to bring some relief to our new people in the room is that I, the pastor, don't actually believe in this. And it's, it's kind of funny. Up here on stage, you guys started laughing at the beginning, and then towards the end, no one was laughing because I think you were thinking, is this guy actually teaching us? <laughs> we need to we need to do this. So I just want to clear the air and say no, we don't. We I don't believe in that. But I wanted to illustrate this point to us of, of if if you take this method and you really just try and sell it with enthusiasm and even bring a little bit of humor into it, it still sounds completely absurd. It's like no man, that's not the way you do things. That's not the way that you deal with things. <laughs> that's not right. And you guys started thinking that you were like. He's actually teaching this. This isn't right. Something in me says that this is not right and that this is wrong. But what happens is we do this anyway. And we do it anyway because it's, 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 it's part of who we are. But it, it's crazy to think we know that this isn't the right way to deal with relationships. And yet we still do it. Now, C4 is also, you know, makes reference to, you know, material that they use to blow stuff up. And that's because if you use the C4 approach, you will blow up all of your relationships. And so I call this actually the C4 failure. So this is the model to the C4 failure. Now, what happens with us is that somewhere in our lives, we rub up against each other, we build relationships with each other, we, we interact with each other, and along the way, after a lifetime of dealing with bad relationships or broken relationships, this somehow becomes our default. So th this is the C4 approach. It doesn't work, but it's still our default. I mean, and, and I, I hope that this exercise at the beginning kind of brings that to your thought, brings that to mind. You know, I want you to engage your thinking throughout this message and really throughout all the sermons that we do up here. I want you to be thinking about this stuff that, that wait a minute, why do I do that? Because that doesn't make sense. Why is that my default? And so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to kick off this series, which is actually called Reassembly Required, A Beginner's Guide to Repairing Broken Relationships. So what we're going to focus on is we're going to focus on repairing the broken relationships that we have. That's what the next four weeks or five weeks are going to be like. Today I'm going to set it up, and then over the next coming weeks we're going to continue to unpack these things. And... If I could put it to you like this, repairing a relationship, well, it, it's, it's kind of, okay, let me give you an example of a car. All of us know how to intuitively get in a car, right? You walk up to the door, you put the key in the door, you click the button, you can open the door, you can get into the car. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to know how to do that. In fact, we intuitively know how to get out of a car. The example to that is my son Benjamin, who's almost three years old, and the other night I took him for a ride in my vehicle, 
And when I do that, we kind of, you know, we never leave first. <laughs> this is maybe going to get us in trouble as parents, but never leave first gear. But we just cruise, you know, up and down the street that we live on and go back and forth. And Benjamin gets to sit in the front seat. Now, he doesn't know anything about a vehicle, but he knows that if he pulls a handle on the door, it's going to open the door. He just intuitively knows how to get out of that door. And that didn't start in my vehicle. It started in Casey's vehicle. And one day she came home and said, we now have to use the child lock on the door, you know, the thing where you open the door and you flick the switch so that the kid can't open it. Because Benjamin learned that he would just reach over and open it. That's an intuitive thing. We learn how to do that very easily. It's also an intuitive thing to, to, to start the car and take it for a drive. None of this is very complicated. And, and relationships are the same way. Starting a relationship is not very complicated. Uh, maintaining and driving a relationship is not very complicated. But the problem is, is that repairing a relationship is complicated. Repairing a relationship is not intuitive. So if we go back to the car example, it would be like this. You, you know how to start and drive your car, but if the engine falls out of the bottom of it while you're driving, it's not an intuitive thing to replace the engine in your car. In fact, if, if you have brake issues or if you have any mechanical issues, I mean, for half of us, if the, if the clock on the CD player goes off, we don't even intuitively know how to fix the, the time on our dashboard in our car. Those things are not intuitive, and repairing a relationship is not intuitive. We don't know what to do when something goes wrong. We know how to start them. We're good at starting them. In fact, we go out and we start so many of them, we continue to start them, and it's so easy to start them that when it comes to repairing a relationship, we'd rather just leave it and then go start another relationship. But So I, I, I want you guys to understand that we all are in the same place. We're going to start on level, level ground. Level playing field. No one in this room is intuitively great at repairing relationships. And I can say that with confidence. Some of us are better than others. But I can say it with confidence because we all have our own nature in us. We have our own way. We have the things in us that drive us. And that creates friction with others. And we're not amazing at repairing things that we've broken. Now, I've, I've got two examples for you that I think will, will help kind of hit this home for you. And the first one, there's a statement that we use. It's this statement, I'm sorry I offended you. Now, this seems like a nice thing to say. You've had an argument with somebody, or you've said something, you know, that was, that was brash, or maybe that was upsetting to somebody, and you realize, I, I think I overstepped my boundary. I think maybe I've upset them a little bit, or, or they're offended. And so you say, I'm sorry I offended you. What, what you don't know is that a lot of times, even though you're saying, I'm sorry, there's actually a different translation that comes with that sorry. And this is an example of how hardwired it is within us that we are not great at repairing relationships. It's so hardwired in us that we find ourselves, even when we say, I'm sorry that I offended you, look at the translation to that. What we're actually saying is, I'm sorry I offended you, translated, you are too easily offended. What I said would not have offended most people, but it offended you. You're too sensitive. It, it's sort of a, a, a backhanded apology. Now, I'm not saying that every time we say sorry, it's not genuine, because it is. But, but so many times, I know I've been here. It's like, you know, you, you feel like I need to say sorry for something. It's like, oh, yeah, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But then under my breath, it's, well... I'm sorry that, you know, you're the one that's actually the problem. Saying this is kind of like saying, I'm sorry that when your head ran into my fist, it hurt your head, you know. It's, like, it's, a, it's a very backhanded thing. You know, another example of where we're not really great at, at repairing relationships when we've done something wrong is when we say something like, hey, I'm sorry, and why are you still upset? Now, I, I went ahead and said that I'm sorry, but you're still upset. I've moved on, but you're still hurting. I don't understand. I mean, look, I'm the good guy here. I'm, I've done things right. I've Okay, I owned up. I did the wrong thing. Now I've said I'm sorry. You should just immediately, with the snap of a finger, be okay with it. But that's not how it works. And oftentimes when we say this, I said I'm sorry, but you're still upset. Let me translate this to you. So put yourself in here. I don't know if anyone can identify with this. The translation, I've done my part. 
you should be okay. Since you are not okay, then clearly something is actually wrong with you. See, we, we, this is just two examples. I want you to think about the relationships in your life that have a little bit of tension in them. Think about the things that... The, the people that you interact with where there is that tension. Think about the resentment maybe that you carry when it comes to other people. And, and it's out of that tension and out of that sort of self-ambition or that pride or that, or that agenda or whatever that it is. It's out of that that we say these things. We say maybe the right things, but the translation, the heart behind it is not right. It's like we can know where to put the engine back into the car, but actually putting the engine back into the car and getting it tuned the right way is not something that we easily do. It's not something that we intuitively do. And so, in fact, I just want you to know that fixing broken relationships is not intuitive. It's, it's not a very intuitive thing that we can do. They're going to put that slide up for you. We have to learn and we have to practice how to do that. See, I wanted you to see this. It's one thing to listen to me say it. But when I, when I think about what I want you to take away from these messages, I think about these things here. And this is, so, this is so foreign to us. It's one thing to sit here and say, okay, that's good advice. Yeah, 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 I understand that. But then as soon as you go home or you leave here or you go to work on a Monday morning or wherever it is that you go that's outside of this space, you immediately start interacting with other people and you immediately start having friction in your relationships and you find yourself applying the C4 approach, even though you know that's not the right way to do it. You want to be controlling or you want to be, you know, uh, convicting. You know, that first statement that I said about, hey, I, I'm, I'm sorry that you're so easily offended. That's like a controlling statement. That's like you're, 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 you're taking control of that situation and saying, oh, I'm sorry that you're so easily offended. You're putting that person in a box. You're controlling them with that. That second statement that we talked about, that's more passive-aggressive. That's more coercing somebody. It's like, oh, you should be okay. You know, I said I'm sorry, but you're still upset. Maybe the issue is in you and not in me. And so we apply the C4 approach because relationships are not intuitive to us. And we have to learn how to practice it and how to do it. Now... A side to this that I get to see as a pastor, and I know that many of you have seen it as well, because part of our job and our role is to counsel people or to give people advice or just help people walk through life. You know, we journey with people through life. And as, you, as we do that, we hear about people that struggle with relationships. And we hear about things that, that have been there for their entire lives. And that is such a shame. It really is. This is where the tragedy of relationships comes in. It's such a tragedy that when we have a bad relationship with somebody, especially a spouse or a father or a, mug, a mother or somebody that has a real significant role in our life and something happens and the relationship has gone awry and it's broken. And so instead, instead of fixing it, it just takes so long for us to actually be able to address that. It takes so long for us to be able to come to a place where we can work on our relationship with them. And, and I hate that because it shouldn't take that long. You know, and it often takes a tragedy. You know, it's easy to, to say, you know, I don't really want to work on my relationship with my mom or my brother or my sister. But we saw, we saw this so much when we were in the heart of COVID. You know, you would see families that were torn apart. And then all of a sudden, there would be a tragedy in a family. Someone would get sick. They would get really sick. And then, only then, people would say, okay, we need to work on this relationship. We need to come together because we're reminded that we are a family. That we are actually a family. And, and the fact that this takes so long, and the fact that this often takes a tragedy, it's a shame. And it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart for the, those, those hurt relationships. And it breaks my heart for those of you that are in those hurt relationships. And the reason that we don't want to deal with this, the reason that this takes so long, the reason that it takes a tragedy for us to even be able to, to, to be motivated to deal with it is because repairing relationships is such an emotional experience. It's an extremely emotional experience. It's, it's, it's a hard experience. It's a hard thing to conjure up to, to deal with. I'll tell you a personal story about mine. 
Um, as many of you know, uh, if you're not new here and you've been here a few times, then you know that here at South Point Church, I, I lead our staff and I lead our volunteers in a way where I want to say that your mental health is extremely important. You know, I think we've tried really hard to just demystify this idea of going to therapy. You know what? Going to therapy is amazing. It's an incredible thing that you can do. If you struggle with mental health in any way, you should go to a therapist. Because it's like going to a gym, but for your emotions and your thoughts. You know, you, you don't go to a gym because you think, well, so many of us, we don't have a problem going to a gym. Because obviously we should go to a gym and work out our muscles and we should be healthy. And all of us have room to be healthy. There's maybe one guy in the room, a guy named David, and he is the definition of muscles and, and health. But for the rest of you, you know that you should go to the gym and build muscles and get healthy. But when we think about doing that for our own mental health, it's like, well, wait a minute, that's weird. No, don't tell people that I need help, I need emotional help, or I need mental health. That's, that's not something that I want to share with people. Well, we've, we've tried to undo that here. And so I talk about my journey with mental health, and I have a therapist that I go to, and I love going. It's like having a superpower. And one of the things, and this hasn't been the most enjoyable thing, but that my therapist is, is having me work through, is we're doing this super fun exercise where you go back to your early childhood, and you write down every bad memory that you've ever had. Doesn't that sound amazing? Yeah. That's amazing. I love it. I, I have PTSD when I think about my next appointment. I'm like, oh, you know. So we've been at this for three years, and I'm finally up to age three. No. Uh, I'm sort of kidding. But what I've learned is that, yes, this is hard. Like, I can tell you firsthand, guys, this, this is hard. I know all the Jesus stuff. I know all the relationship stuff. And yet, I still find myself applying the C4 approach to relationships or on the receiving end of somebody that has applied the C4 approach to a relationship with you. And what that does is it hurts. It really, really hurts. And so the reason that it takes us so long to deal with our relationships or the reason it takes a tragedy to motivate us to deal with it is because there is true and real emotional pain and emotional scarring that happens in us. And if that's you, if that's you that's just, that has that emotional baggage, I just want you to hear that it's okay. And I want you to hear that you're going to be okay. And I want you to know that you're not broken. And I want you to know that even if you've been the one that's hurt people, or you're the one that's been hurt by people, you're not broken. It's not over for you. You can work through these things. Yes, it's going to be hard, but you can work through them. And that's why we're doing this series. That's why I'm excited about what I get to teach you today, because there's something at the end of this message that is so beautiful it's such a beautiful truth to understand and see and know. And when we take that out today, it's, I, I promise you, it's going to bring a lightness to the load that you carry when it comes to bad relationships. It's going to bring a lightness to your heart. It's even going to help with some of this, this emotional pain or this, this experience that you've had emotionally with these bad relationships. And so I want to tell you what our goals are for today. So, what is our goal for broken relationships? Because we need to know where we're headed. We need to know what we're going to talk about, what we're not going to talk about. And I just want you to know up front that one of the things that's not your goal, that's not our goal, is that reconciliation is not our real goal. So, do you know what reconciliation means? It, it means to reconcile. It means to bring back into right standing. It means to bring into good standing. It means to restore something that has been broken. It means to make sense of something. It, 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 it's reconciling a relationship. is like restoring what has been broken in a relationship. Bringing something that is good back into that relationship. But that's not our real goal. Now, it's a great goal, but the reason it's not our real goal is because in order to fully reconcile a relationship, you have to have control of all the pieces. You need to be able to control everything, and we don't have that. You can only control you. You can't control the other person. You can't control the environment. You can't control the culture. You can't control the other person's family or their influences. You can't even control the influences on you. There's so many environmental things and relational things in us that we can't control. So you know what? Reconciliation is 
what we want. But this is not our real goal because it's not obtainable. It's not something that we can actually reach for and that we can actually do. And now, I've got a pro tip for you here. Never assign an agenda to someone else. You, you never want to set a goal for another adult. See, we don't like having goals set for us. We don't like when someone tells us, hey, this is my goal for you. It's not going to work out great if I go up to my wife in our relationship and I say, hey, uh, Casey, I just want you to know that it's my goal for you to get better at accepting me for who I am. Yeah, right? Just watching for lightning, something that, you know, that may come down. That, it, it sounds absurd, right? But we do it. We walk into relationships with, uh, we walk into conversations with expectations. We walk into them with this, this hope or this thing that's already worked in our mind of, this is what I hope I get from this, and this is what I hope comes out of this. And you know what? If this person would just see this differently, if they would see it my way, then this would go so much easier. And what that is, is we're bringing an agenda into our conversation with this other person. That's us having an agenda. Now, agendas are not a good thing. It, it's, it's not something that no one likes this. See, you don't, no one enjoys being evaluated and judged. Do you? Is there ever a time when you enjoy being around other people who always evaluate and judge you? No. No one likes that. And we can smell that out when we get around somebody that has an agenda for us. We can actually feel it. It's like, man, this person's judging me. They're evaluating me. They're evaluating how effective I am in dealing with them or talking to them or having this relationship with them, even if it's an unhealthy relationship. And so we've got to stop having an agenda because we've got to accept and realize that other people do not enjoy being evaluated and judged by us. And so we've got to let that go. Now, I, in order to let that go, and in order for us to really move forward through this message, and for us to move forward through this, I, I, I want to explain to you the Jesus approach, or the Jesus method to dealing with relationships. And the way that Jesus did it, and they, they've got a slide for you here, Josh, if you can bump forward a couple slides, the Jesus model here for you. The Jesus model is this. If reconciliation is the restoration of a relationship, then the story of our salvation is the greatest example of reconciliation. So I'll read that for you one more time. Now this, We're going to unpack this in a little bit. If reconciliation is the restoration of a relationship, then the story of our salvation is the greatest example of reconciliation. See, we... We can't reconcile ourselves or others because we can't control all the pieces. That's why, it's, that's why that's not our goal. But what I hope that we can do, something that's in our power to do, is we can do everything that we can to make sure and remove all the barriers. To remove all the barriers from somebody else being able to develop a relationship with us. We want to be able to remove all the barriers to a relationship that's broken so that we can take the steps towards fixing that relationship. Or you know what? If you can't fix a relationship, then what would happen if you removed the barriers that you've got up and then that would allow somebody on the other side of that barrier to get through and actually work on that relationship with you? See, what we're going to see as we unpack this Jesus model is that Jesus is the only one that can actually reconcile us. He can actually fully restore our relationship. And it, this is where it gets into this amazing truth that we get to wrap our heads around. And it, it's this. So God, He wanted more than just forgiveness for us. So if true reconciliation is something that is worked out in our salvation, which for those of you that maybe you're not a Christian or you're new here to church, this idea behind salvation is when I say, okay, I know I'm a sinner, I know and I, I accept and I admit that I've done wrong and that I'm sinful. And I accept and I admit that Jesus came and he gave his life for me on the cross. And three days later, he rose 
And then he walked around and he visited with people and then he ascended into heaven and then he gave us the Holy Spirit. And I accept that for my life and I want that for my life. And then all of a sudden you see this beautiful restoration where now there was before a gap between us and God. And after we accept Jesus, after Jesus comes into our life, we're reconciled, which means that we're fully brought back into relationship with God. Now, God wanted more than just forgiveness. So what does that mean? See, God could have forgiven you without restoring you back to Him. God could have said, okay, Chris, I forgive you for all of your sins, but I'm not going to let you back into relationship with me. You were a sinful person. You did all these things wrong. Yes, you asked for forgiveness. Great, fine. But I'm not going to let you back into a relationship with me. Now, this is something that we do all the time. And sometimes this is not a bad thing because we're dealing with each other and we're sinful people. Because there's bad people out there in the world. And sometimes we do have to forgive but not let people back in. Sometimes that's the safe thing to do. And so if it's a matter of safety, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. But what I am talking about is, is everything else. And that we will, we will forgive people. But that's just one step. And God shows us that the forgiveness part, yeah, that's the easy part. But He wanted something so much more for us. And so He sent Jesus. That goes back to the Jesus model. Where Jesus fully reconciled us. Jesus fully restored us in our relationship. And, and that's why salvation is the greatest example of reconciliation. Because God wanted more than just forgiveness for you. He wanted to actually reconcile us back to Him. And so, that's this beautiful thing. But what's happened over time, and this is a shameful thing, and I, I hate to admit this because here I am leading a church, but... See, the church has done something with what God intended. The church has actually separated forgiveness from reconciliation. So God wanted more than just forgiveness for us. He wanted us to have more than forgiveness. He wanted us to be restored back to our relationship with Jesus. But what the church has done, the church has said, hey, reconciliation is actually kind of really hard. And so we, we as a church are just going to teach people that they need forgiveness. You know, you just need to be forgiven. You need forgiveness for your sins. How many times have we heard in a service that you need to choose Jesus because you need forgiveness for your sins? Very rarely do we hear somebody say, hey, you, I hope that you find Jesus in your life because God wants to be brought back into a relationship with you and reconciled with you. And the church has removed those two because those two are, are, are one of them is much harder to do than the other one. And then not only has the church kind of separated these out and messed that up, but Christianity. Christianity has actually reduced forgiveness without reconciliation. So Christianity has said, you know, hey, the whole point to this is forgiveness. It's like we fully even got just let go of and got rid of the idea of reconciliation. So here we have a, a place where maybe the church has let us down, and then we have a place where, where Christianity has kind of let us down. And that makes it really easy then for the C4 approach to come in and take place because if the church has removed reconciliation and if Christianity has removed reconciliation or restoration of a relationship, then how are we going to know how to do it? How are we going to know what we do? And so I've got to take you guys back to this thing that is, is the Jesus approach. And see, the Jesus approach is that he did not just forgive, he actually reconciled. And I'm going to explain this to you through a guy named Paul. So Paul's a guy that he was reconciled, you know, to Jesus. But he's a guy that we've been talking about a lot. And it's kind of hard not to talk about Paul because he wrote the majority of the New Testament. But Paul was a guy that, that was, was someone that was actually out killing Christians. He was judging Christians. He was trying to distinguish, distinguish this thing called the way. He was trying to get rid of it. And the way was this following of Jesus after he rose and went to heaven. And Paul said, I'm going to go out and I'm going to destroy this thing because this is not Judaism. And so he, Paul was trying to completely get rid of and abolish the movement that Jesus came for. And Paul, in his journey of doing that, had this encounter with God. And he experienced, not only from God did he experience forgiveness, but he actually experienced reconciliation. Paul 
knew that he was restored back to a relationship with God. It, he knew that he was more than just forgiven. And so with that knowledge of him knowing and experiencing, not only am I forgiven, but I'm walking in communion with Jesus, walking in communion with God. Paul writes to, to the Philippians in chapter 2, verse 5, and he, he says this to him. He says, in your relationships with one another. Now, one another, that means, that means everyone. It's not in your relationship with your best friend or in your relationship with your mom or your family or in your relationship with one brother but not the other sister. No, Paul says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Have the same mindset as Jesus. So what is that mindset? Now, this to me is the most exciting part because, see, what Jesus does is he tells a story about how uh, 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 if a shepherd loses one sheep, so if a shepherd has 100 sheep in a, in a flock and they lose one sheep, he, he, as a good shepherd, will go after the one sheep. He'll leave the 99 to bring the one back. And see, this is a bit mind-boggling for people in this time because people of the time, they would think, no, 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 that's not how church works. That's not how God works. The way God works and the temple works is we get it right here in this building. We get Jesus right here. We get God right here. And it's here that everything is right. Out there, everything is wrong. And you know what? If you choose to leave church and you choose to leave God and go wander out in the wilderness, well, then you know what? That's on you. That's, you, that's your problem, and that's on you. And so instead, what we're going to do is we're going to keep doing this thing here right, and then when you're ready to come back in here with us, then you can come back in here with us. But Jesus flipped this completely on his head. And Jesus said, you know what? I'm going to go after the one. And they just could not understand it. They couldn't get their mind around this idea that why would Jesus go after the one? Well, the reason that Jesus went after the one is because in order for you to know what it's like to go after somebody in a broken relationship, you need to understand what it was like to have Jesus come after you. Because we are all the one. We're the sheep. We're the sinful person. We're the broken person. And we're the one that, that we left the pen. We left the flock. And Jesus went after you. See, not only does God, this is why God wants more than just forgiveness for you. And you have to understand this. You've got to understand this simple, simple thing. And, and, and after this, we're going to be done. We're almost done. But you've got to understand this simple truth. And the truth is this, is that you, all the broken in you, all the good in you, all the magnificent in you, the wonderful in you, but also all the hurt and all the pain and all the mistakes and the things that you've done wrong, everything that is you, you are pursued. You are pursued by a loving Heavenly Father. And when God looked at you, when Adam and Eve sinned, and when man split from God because there was now sin introduced into that relationship, God would spend all of the, if you think about your Bible, all of the Old Testament, and then He would spend the majority of the New Testament, and then on, in pursuit of you. In pursuit of restoring a relationship back with you. And Jesus modeled this so perfectly when he told the story of going after the one sheep. Because it's not just about forgiveness. It's about restoration. It's about reestablishing a relationship. And so one of the things that I want you to think about as we get ready to close this out is, is this. You need to accept and understand but mostly accept, accept it, believe it, and own it, that God sends Jesus after you because he wants more than just to forgive you. He wants to actually restore you back into a relationship with him. He wants to reconcile, he wants to restore, he wants to reassemble a broken relationship and repair it so that you can enter into a full, wonderful, wide-open relationship with God. And so what I would have you to think about is I would have you to think, what is actually stopping you from accepting? What is stopping you from accepting the reality that God sent His Son, Jesus, not only to forgive you, but to come after you? 
And over the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about how we can go after others. We're going to be talking about how we can work on our relationships. So I'm going to give you four things over the next four weeks. And each week we'll talk about one thing that's going to help your relationships to be better. Help repair the broken relationships that you have. But before we move into that, you've got to accept the fact that Jesus came after you. And Paul said, have the same mindset of Jesus. So in order for us to have a mindset of Jesus... We've got to understand Jesus' mindset, and it is an abundance of love that we have a hard time wrapping our head around. It's one we don't understand. It's one we can't even imagine. It's that Jesus would love us so much that he would chase us down, he would leave the 99, and he would go chase after us. And so, as the band comes out and we get ready to do one more worship song What I want you to think about is that what's stopping you from believing and accepting that you are fully restored in the most important relationship that you could ever have? And if you don't have a relationship with Jesus or a relationship with God, then I want you to know that that relationship is wide open and it's available for you. It's there for you to take. And there is nothing. So many of us feel like we're disqualified from a relationship with Jesus. We feel like we're disqualified from a relationship with God. Well, let me just remind you that this thing right here, every single page in this book is dedicated to you understanding that Jesus is in pursuit of you every single day. And when you accept that, when you accept that love for you, now we've got something that we can build on. Now we've got something that we can work on. Now, as we start to work on those relationships over the next few weeks, we're going to carry into it this truth that we were loved and we were accepted. So let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you, Father.